let's also talk about what's happened to these pipelines. Mysterious leaks in the Nord Stream gas pipe network uh, began. We understand now the evidence coming from it, lots of independent sources about from seismic readings of uh, basically some subsea blast sabotage of both Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2, uh, mm -hmm. seeing these, what they were, the owner called unprecedented breakages. Um, the Russians have been accused of actually basically sabotaging their own pipelines, uh, very much to the south, very much close. These are the pipelines, of course, that carry gas from Russia uh, to Men and Europe. Usually priority would be Germany as the main uh, gas, gas consumer. Um, but given that Russia is not supplying gas through those pipes right now, and given that we have got those sanctions on Russia, is it the only likely explanation that Russia is behind this? Because there's a lot of talk that actually it may be possibly even America behind mm. these blasts. What do you make no, of these, no, these claims? There's, there's no chance it would be any, anything else apart from the Russians. There's no logic Why do you say it. that? Well, because the Americans don't go around blowing up Russian pipelines. Um, okay. look, there's, a tiny, there's a tiny, tiny chance it might be an accident. I mean, I'll... I'll just put that out there. I mean, I don't believe for one second it is. Uh, it's the Russians destroying their own kit, and they're doing it for... It's a bizarre thing to do, but if there is a logic to it... Um, one, because they weren't supplying gas for these pipelines, so blowing it up sends a signal of escalation and a hostility to the West. Uh, they can always supply through the Amal, Druzhba and other pipelines that go through Belarus, uh, Ukraine, Poland, etc., and indeed Turkish stream through the Black Sea. Uh, it creates uncertainty because if you're destroying pipelines, are more going to be destroyed. It signals escalation, as I've said, and there's a potential threat to do the same to the Norway pipeline, Norway-Poland um, pipeline, which I think is due to open tomorrow if it hasn't already opened in the last couple of days. And yet that's where the timing of this seems very significant. It is. I mean, I think the Russians are, uh, are saying if we're going to destroy our own pipelines, just think what we could do to yours. Um, nobody is being supplied through the North stream one and two pipe nobody has ever been supplied through Nord Stream through should never have been built the Germans should never have agreed to it um, Nord, Nord Stream one hasn't supplied anyone since August so the Russians can still supply potential allies in Europe like Hungary and any of the some of the Balkan countries Serbia okay. They can continue to supply those through other pipelines, but it, it seems to be an incredibly reckless and dangerous thing to do to signal actually physical threat to the West. And maybe look after cyber pipe, I mean cyber, you know, lines and uh, sub sub ocean lines. Look, we've we've been seeing this fight back from Ukraine, and we've seen the announcement of these referendums uh, and uh, taking place. I think the last vote was yesterday. I think uh, in very, very four different regions in the Donbass. Victory is expected to be claimed by Vladimir Putin, uh, we think, as early as Thursday or Friday in these completely sham referendums. Um, do you think that, that once that has happened, that, that something is going to change in terms of the Russian strategy? What, what should we be looking for? You've been keeping a very close eye on all of this. The last two weeks have seen a change in the dynamic in the war. We've moved to a new phase in the war, and the Russians are going to be going on the defensive. And the occupation and the seizure of territory within the Russian Federation and declaring it to be part of the Russian Federation is all about the Kremlin and Vladimir Putin desperately trying to shore up what they have in Ukraine for fear of losing it. They're not probably not going to be able to make further gains. So the mobilization, the threats of nuclear war, the integration of that or the annexation and integration of that land in Hassan is up a um, into Russia is a defense, is fundamentally a defensive act. It also technically brings that land under the Russian nuclear umbrella, which enables the Russians to continue to make threats of nuclear war. Yeah, indeed. We, yeah, we've seen the the uh, uh, the Ned Jens uh, Stoltberg, haven't we? He's uh, the NATO chief threatening uh, Putin over this this issue. Uh, whether it's not that's something that's seriously going to go ahead. Um, let's talk also about. about... I, wouldn't, I wouldn't assume it's just a threat, Julia, because no. we we don't know. B, it might not be, and C, the way that you minimise the risk of tactical nuclear weapons or any nuclear weapons being used is by the Western military and political planners getting serious about the risk and effectively. Yeah reverse engineering solutions out of it. I would take it seriously. Oh, I, oh, I absolutely take everything Vladimir Putin uh, says seriously on that front because well, the trouble is the West has had a really bad habit of not taking him seriously. So when he amassed more than 100,000 troops and military <laughs> hardware on the uh, border of Ukraine, then everyone, well, of course he's not actually Julia, going to invest. You know, you're invest. absolutely right, but it, it goes back further than that. I mean, Putin very openly declared a new Cold War in 2007. Yeah. We completely 
ignored him. The Georgian war happened, we ignored it. The um, the Ukraine uh, annexation of Donbass and Lugansk happened, we ignored it. All the law, yeah. all the oligarchs were running running around the rest, West hiring uh, finance companies, law companies. We ignored it yeah. because it was in our interest. No, we've been ignoring this 15 years, and we need to get ahead of the game.